This week, we air part two of our fifth pre-recorded segment called Say Easy, Do Hard. Inspired by my co-host, Jason Albuquerque, we get our hands dirty and discuss the challenges of hiring a CISO. How will the new SEC regulations impact the role for both organizations and individuals? Business security starts now. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Panoptica, Cisco's cloud application security solution, provides end-to-end lifecycle protection for cloud-native application environments. It empowers organizations to safeguard their APIs, serverless functions, containers, and Kubernetes environments. Panoptica ensures comprehensive cloud security, compliance, and monitoring at scale, offering deep visibility, contextual risk assessments, and actionable remediation insights for all your cloud assets. Get more information at securityweekly.com forward slash Panoptica. If your organization is ready to embrace edge computing, we have good news. The 2023 AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report provides everything you need to know to get started. In the report, we identify the common characteristics of edge computing. We found edge use cases are rapidly coming online, and we reveal how to secure edge computing. Most importantly, you'll learn how to prepare for your edge ecosystem. Get your complimentary copy of the report today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash ATT Cybersecurity. That's security securityweekly.com forward slash ATT cybersecurity. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 335, recorded January 4th, 2024, but will air on January 22nd, 2024. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this segment are my co-hosts from the previous segment. First, Mr. Ben Carr. Welcome back, Ben. Hi. Welcome. Good nice to be here. Nice to finish this up and talk about uh, the, the CISO search side. Interesting topic. Yes, absolutely. And also back with us for this segment, Mr. Josh Marpet. Hey, Josh. Hey, pleasure to be back. I'm, I'm, this is a fascinating discussion about CISOs, man. This is going to be fun. Yeah, we're going to get into some good stuff here in a second. Join our Discord channel to chat with us throughout the live show today. Well, maybe not today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash discord to receive an invite and become part of our community. All right, so let's continue this conversation. So in the first part of this, we really talked about hiring a CISO from the organizational side. In this segment, we're gonna flip this over and talk about the hiring from the individual side. And and Ben, obviously, you know, we, we touched on points of this in the first segment on, you know, as an individual interviewing for a CISO role, like what's the first like thing you, you want to know? Like what's the first thing that's going to tell you whether this is a good opportunity or not a good opportunity? Yeah, uh, it's money, right? I mean, we, we always want to know what the money is. And I, I say that half in jest, but that's, that's part of the benchmark, right? It shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily be the first thing you're looking for, but it's also a good indicator of where they're placing importance on the role, right? Um, I think you've got to balance that against the size of the organization and what the responsibilities are. If it's publicly traded, I think, you know, teeing off of our last conversation on this, then you've got to ask right off the bat, like, who's responsible for the risk here? It, does the risk fall on my shoulders? Am I signing off on this, or is it somebody else? That'll also give you a really big indicator of like where they're placing uh, the importance of the role and how seriously they take it. Um, I think you've got to ask questions like, who's the reporting structure? Like, where's the alignment here? Um, what's the team size look like, and what's your structure look like? And then. Have you written out, like, do you have a definition um, you know, for the role of what the CISO is responsible for, what the authority is, and, and what are the specific responsibilities that are under the CISO? I mean, it, was the job just scraped, the job description just scraped off of LinkedIn, or did was it actually thoughtful? And, and who's the interview panel look like? Are you interviewing with the right people? Those are all, I mean, at the, right from the start, those are really good things to think about. 
I mean, yeah, Ben, it sounds did... like you're saying that, that a CISO candidate should do a lot of research on the company they're, they're planning to, to potentially work for. Yeah, I, I think so. You should look at, you should really look into who's the executive stat. Look, one of the first things I do if, if I'm being asked is, do they list their current CISO or security policy on their webpage? Like, how public are they about it? How transparent are they about it? Have they had any breaches or are there any issues, right? Like, you, you need to do research on your side. I mean, we talked about this in the last session. You can't think about this as, you know, the, the typical interview is like you get asked questions for 45, 50 minutes, and then you've got five to 10 minutes to ask, like, what's the company, um, what, 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 what's the company like? Um, what's the vibe? Like, those aren't questions that a CISO should be asking. You should be asking some difficult questions and you need to look about it, look at it as a 50, 50 conversation where you're, you're trying to source, is this the right role for you? It's, it's at that level. It's important. I do want to get into the questions you asked during an interview process, but I don't want to quite go there yet because I'm trying to think about the research, the disconnects, the potential warning signs before you even get to the interview process, right? Because I think to, to Josh, your point and, and Ben, like you got to do your research on these companies, right? Who is the company? How transparent have they been? But then, Ben, you 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 said a couple things that I just want to kind of go back to, like salary versus reporting structure like if there's a disconnect there like if they're offering you you know let's just make up a number 250 is the salary for this position but they want you to own all the cyber risk reporting to the ceo there's probably a little bit of a disconnect there isn't there yeah yeah 100 percent yeah, that, right. those are I, the, the red flags that get kicked off, right? When you need, you know, you need, you see something, right? It's a, it's a CISO role reporting to the CIO who reports to the CEO, and they're only offering one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Like that's a director level position. That's not a C level position. <laughs> yeah, you're and, right. So, big, big warning sign. Like if you're looking for a CISO role, that's not the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, again, this is, you know, this is an interesting point. For. This also depends on what you see as a CISO role. Going back to our uh, last week's segment, you know, there are different types of CISOs. There are different types of CISO responsibilities. There are different types of, uh, of, 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 you know, different boundaries of this is a CISO or this is a CISO or whatever. So it depends on what you want to do. Does it match up with what the company wants to have done? And if it matches, well, and, and the salary is good and the, and the insurance is good, and that's actually a big thing we'll talk about in a minute, then, then maybe this is right for you. But if it's not, then, you know, if they want a certain type of CISO, uh, going to Ben's brilliant six types of CISOs, if they want a certain type of CISO and you're like, they're idiots, they need this type of CISO, and that's not me, then walk away, man. It's, it's a bad idea. Okay, so yeah, like, you've got. And I don't, good. We, we we've talked about Josh. I think we we generally agree on this, but um, you know, I think where where I I have a problem is for me, language matters, right? It's important, and there's a couple reasons for that. If you're if you're going into a role expecting that you're actually going to be a CISO, but again, let's use that previous example. It's reporting to the CIO. Um, you don't ever report to the executive staff. You're, you know, you're not included in those meetings. You don't have board reporting responsibility. Um, you know, you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. It's a, you know, billion dollar company. You're probably only a director. So you need to realize like what that means. If you go into that role thinking you're going to be a CISO and thinking you're going to go, hey, I need to implement a security policy. Here's the security policy. And you start to roll it out. You're going to get a lot of pushback and it's not going to be a successful deployment. You're going to be frustrated. The CIO is probably going to get aggravation from the other C-level execs because you're, you're operating out of your perceived authority. And so that creates a ton of friction, right? And that results in people not being happy with the role and short tenures. And so what I would advise is if you're happy with that role and you want the title, that's fine, I guess. But as an industry, like we need to be clear that the language matters and that's not a CISO, that's a director of cyber or something, right? And I think the rest of the org would see that as a better title too. When you're going in and you need the authority to get something done, you need the backing of the other C-level execs, just like you know they're going to need your backing at times to actually make things happen. So I think it's important to understand and have clear delineation on what you're being expected to do and what you 
what you're expecting out of the role. And that disconnect is why a lot of people in a lot of companies are unhappy with the role of the CISO sometimes. But, and that's interesting yeah. because, you know, it, it's a perspective and a perception thing as well as a reality thing. And I, I find that fascinating that the perception of CISO can damn you or doom you in your role uh, uh, just, as, just as well as actually not doing your job or doing your job too well. So it's, it, it's it, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. And Josh, it could doom you before you even walk in the door. I mean, think yeah, about this, absolutely. right? If that position is is titled wrong and positioned wrong from the get-go, you could be doomed before you even walk in the door and start the job. Yeah, uh, the fact it, it, is, is that you can be doomed before you walk in the door by regulation. Uh, you can be doomed before you walk in the door by perception. They're going to come in and fix everything. And there's just no possibility of doing that in less than a three-year, multi-million-dollar plan. And they've got fifty bucks and a piece of pocket lint, and they've got about three minutes before the audit team comes in. <laughs> Excuse me, you're not fixing anything, okay? Yeah, Except maybe but, tying your even, shoes. Even worse, though, Josh is like so. Like, look, it's a fair fight if you're doomed by regulation, right? <laughs> it's a fair fight if you're doomed by market dynamics that are causing you know issues with budgets, right? So those are all fair fights that every executive has to go through. But the, the unfair fight is when you go in and you're trying to get something done, and because you're titled as the CISO, but you're leveled as a director, you will be the scapegoat. Like, without a doubt, you will be the scapegoat. They will look to you and point and say, this is our CISO, this was the person responsible, it was done poorly, and they will turn to that, right? And you won't really have a defense. Like you'll get walked. It just it'll happen. Like that's I've seen it too many times with people in the industry. And so that's yeah. the unfair fight. Like if you're the director and you have a director title and you're doing what you can and something happens, like you you may get caught up in it somehow, but you don't have the title for them to fall back on you and go, well, it was the CISO that did it. Like the SEC is going to want to know who had responsibility for it. It's much harder without that title for them to point to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost a protection mechanism, I think, for the individual that if you're not in a true CISO level role, don't take that title because you could be the scapegoat in that situation and probably not what you want. All right, so let's get into some of the interview questions and some of the things you want to understand when you get in. Let's say there is an alignment. Let's say that the salary expectations been are aligned, the reporting position, the basic responsibilities are aligned. You get into the interview process. Like what are the things you want to know during the interview process that are going to tell you whether this is a fit or not? Yeah, so look, I, I think it's fair to bring up those archetypes, right? It kind of explain what they are or somewhat if they're not if the person's not familiar with them and say like, you know, sometimes you may know, right? If you're coming in and they, they've had a big breach and they've been transparent about it, you can say, Hey, I think you're looking for a post breach person. And like, what's your timeline to recovery here? Like what, what are you expecting the rebuild looks like? Um, if they don't know, and you're coming in, like, I think you want to be clear, like, do you see yourself as a steady state company? Like, are you, are you looking to do something transformational on the security side? Or is it just, you know, you want to keep the lights on and you know, minimize the risk portfolio? What's your investment look like? What's the, what's the P&L look like for this uh, operating line? And do, you know, how do I, what's your expectation on budget like increases? How do we, how do we align on that? Right. Um, I think those are those are really important things to think about. What's the team look like, right? Who who are the leaders on the team? I mean, I think you should get some sense of, you know, who the people who will be reporting into you, and do you have authority to come in and make changes, or is the expectation you're going to have to work with the team you have? Th those are all those are all really good starts and tell you tell you a ton about the organization. Who do you want to interview with besides? I, I, my guess is you want to meet with the CEO. You hope that, I guess, depending on who the role reports into, who else do you want to interview with to get an understanding of the company? Is there a certain expectation of who you should be interviewing with during the process? Yeah, it depends. Some, I think some, somewhat around the company itself and like what the structure is. But I'd certainly like to interview with the head of legal, right? I'd certainly like to interview with the CFO. Um, 
optimally, I'd like to interview with somebody on the board, right? Um, especially if there's board reporting involved, who's the person on the board who's aligned to cyber and get that. Those are, those are kind of the key. Um, in some cases it's, it's, you know, the right motion to interview with whoever the, you know, number one or number two is underneath the, the CISO. Um, so, you know, your head of security operations or, um, you know, head of uh, architecture and engineering for security, wh whoever those people are, you may want to interview with them. But look, I, I'm a fan of keeping the interview panel short. I don't think you want to interview with eight people either, right? Um, and so th those are those are the kind of tops in my mind. I don't know, Josh, does that, does that align? Do you, anybody I'm missing, you think? I apologize. The last couple sentences got garbled for me, but basically, you know, it, it's, it's interviewing with the wrong people is going to totally screw your whole world up when it comes to figuring what the company needs and wants and interviewing with the, the right people and asking the wrong questions is going to screw up their world as to who you are. So it's, it's, it's such a, I'm trying to figure out how to even say this, excuse me. Um, like, Ben, I, I got to ask this question because it came up to me just a minute ago and it's blown my mind. What's the worst question you've ever been asked? Oh, geez, uh, that's a that's a hard one, Josh. Um, trying to think what the trying to think on some of the recent stuff that I've been asked. Um, it, it's just all it's all over the board. I can't think of anything really, really stupid. Um, I guess the worst questions I get asked are just the ones that don't don't actually matter at all, right? Like okay. you get asked tons of questions that just aren't relevant to the role at all and aren't relevant to like you being an executive leader. Um, it, it's just, it, it, I mean, they it, it can fall apart very quickly when you realize like they're, they're really not taking the role seriously. Are, are there any questions that are an instant? I'm done here. Have a nice day. Goodbye. And maybe you don't actually walk out, but you're like, you just check next in your head. I'm yeah, honestly probably are. It's, hard. it's hard to think about something that I've gotten. Uh, uh, if I get told that this reporting that the reporting structure is completely misaligned, like that can be, that can be a deal killer, right? If I get yeah, told absolutely. that, um, you yeah, look, I, it's weird. Like in this, what I find a lot is like, there's been a lot of back into the office kind of stuff. And I think that's, that for me can be challenging if it doesn't make any sense. Like we want you to be in the office in, uh, Chattahooga, but the person you're reporting to and half of the team is in Santa Clara. And you're like, for what ungodly purpose? Like that doesn't make any sense. Like when, when structure starts to fall apart within an organization, that's when I start to question stuff. Like we're forcing everyone to come into the office, but nobody works together. That's like, that's weird stuff. Like you can tell that the organization is trying to force something together that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Yeah. And, and the return to office mandates, uh, in my opinion, are insane, especially for security people. We tend to work better with headphones and leave me the hell alone um but like you know the CISO to come to the headquarters i get it but for the average worker to be in the office uh maybe one day a week other than that what's the damn point okay uh and then if you're re required to go to an office and your people aren't there why don't we just do this over zoom okay this is this is crazy uh reporting structure another huge one budget for me another huge one if I go, okay, so you want, and let, let's assume that we've gone through an interview and we've said, okay, so you want a transformational CISO? Great. I understand where you're going with this. These are the things, these are some of the initiatives you want to do. What's your budget look like for this for the next few years, you know, six months, year, 18 months, two years, whatever. And they go, oh, you know, we've got the 50 bucks in a piece of pocket lint I think I mentioned earlier. Uh, I mean, that, that, bye. I'm pretty much done. Is there any way we can increase yeah, that budget? No, no, no. I, that's I'm that's sure. more than enough. I thought you were saying, like, what are the questions I've been asked that, that are game killers? But, yeah, look, there's a bunch of questions that if, if I'm asking them that are game killers, and the budget's a huge one. Like, if they can't tell you what the P&L is for the role, that's a big flag. Like, you don't understand the P&L for this organization, unless it's a brand-new role, but they should at least be able to tell you what their current spend is on the security organ structure, right? Like, oh, God, that, yeah. that's a big um, do yeah. so. There's a lot of stuff that you can't suss out and figure out um, 
whether you have authority or responsibility, because it's hard to ask some of those questions, right? Do I, I mean, ultimately you should be able to ask the CEO, do I have ultimately authority and responsibility for the cyber structure in this organization and making decisions with regard to that? And you'll get an answer hopefully back, something like, yes, you have, you have authority to do that. Obviously we have to fit in with budget constraints and, you know, what our, uh, what our earnings are looking like, and you know we'll have we'll have debates about that list like we have any other um, organizational area, but ultimately responsible for that. But sometimes those are like you can get that answer and you don't know if it's really true. Like you've got to go around and figure out like ask questions about do you have the ultimate authority to hire and uh, fire staff if, if you need to make changes in it? Like do you have that authority? And if you get a lot of runaround on that, like if you can't manage your own staff. That's an indication that you're going to have trouble in the rest of the org trying to get things done where you think you might have authority. Yeah, agreed. I mean, you got to look through kind of the, if I'm coming in to be a leader, right, do I have the ability to lead my team and make the changes that need to be made? Uh, do I have the budgets to support my team, et cetera? So let's say, look, you get you, the, the role looks like it's a fit. You get through the interview process. Um, there's, there's alignment, there's interest on both sides. The last piece of this is as you're, as you're finalizing the employment agreement and the offer, like what are the, the intangible, <laughs> like what are the things that have to be in there? Like for, for, I, I think part of this probably Ben depends on kind of what the expectation uh, of, of this role yeah. is, right? If you're, if, you know, if you're really just a director, that's completely different, but let's assume you are responsible for cyber risk reporting to the SEC. You're going to hold the bag. Like there's got to be certain things that just have to be in that agreement. Otherwise you're walking away. Yeah. So, so, you know, obviously the, the first things that are going to come to everybody's mind is you're going to ask about, you know, what's salary, what's bonus, and then what's my long-term incentive plan, right? And that's, that's kind of standard for everybody. You're going to get that at a director level position. But when you start really looking at a C-level role, if this is really titled as a C-level role, you've got to be thinking about, okay, if I have an issue that happens in the company and I get walked and I'm not, it's not my it's not my problem, right? I didn't commit sexual assault. I didn't do, it wasn't malfeasance. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a problem with me, right? Um, what is my compensation in that? So like you may be out for quite a bit of time. Like, you know, the, when you, as you go up the chain, there are fewer, fewer and fewer roles. So it becomes harder and harder to source that. So you've got to think about what's your severance package. Is it, is it six months? Is it 12 months? Is it longer? Like I think average is probably around somewhere between six to 12 months is, is what the average severance is. Um, you've got to figure out, does that make sense to you? Um, what's the, what, what happens to your options, right? Um, do they, do they vest immediately? Do they, if you get walked, do they not vest? Um, if there's stock on the table, if there's a change in control in the org, if, if the company gets sold or bought, like what happens to stock? Is there a double trigger on it? And then you've got to think about some really hard stuff now, right? Are you on DNO insurance? And when you ask that question, hey, am I included in DNO? You may get an answer like, uh, yeah, of course you're covered by the insurance policy of the company. That is not a good answer. That means you're not on DNO insurance. DNO insurance is for listed directors and officers of the company. So the officers who are listed in corporate charter and the you know the people who are on the directors, the you know, non-executive director, the board of directors. You have to be included in that. You have to physically be included to be covered by that policy. So if something happens, if you get sued by the SEC and you need to be covered by that insurance policy, then if you're not listed, you're not going to be covered, right? We now need to be thinking about what about indemnification, right? So indemnification being different than DNO, and I you know preface this by saying I'm not an attorney. But if you're not if you're not thinking about the fact that you could still get sued by you know other people or have things happen that you know don't again even if you're covered by DNO may not be covered, you need to make sure you're protected and you're indemnified against that risk. The final piece of the puzzle, I think, and look, I could be missing something, Josh, I'm pipe in if you think I'm missing something here. But the, the final piece that I'm starting to think about that we may need to think about is CISOs, and this is, this is a harder one to figure out how to get it included. You may need to think about getting something including in your salary package or getting the company to pay for it as a separate line item is separate 
legal representation. So you may need to get, and there are a couple of attorneys that are starting to do this, separate legal representation for the CISO. So in case something happens, let's just assume you've got an incident, it's in progress, and your, your chief legal officer of the company says, hey, we're going to do this. You need to know you personally, if you go along with that decision, is that in your best interest or are you now making are you not making a decision that's putting you in legal jeopardy? Right. And if, if that's the case, then you need to say, hey, I'm, I'm not signing that or um, I want I, you need to send a memo saying I'm not in agreement with it. Those kind of things you've got to think about, like, is your salary high enough where it's covering that potential cost that you may have to incur now? Or is there something in the package that is going to cover that potential eventuality of having to have somebody on retainer to do that? So that's a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know if I missed anything, but that, that's what I'm thinking in a highlight that you know kind of comes into well, the things you got to think, think about. I think you could cover. You could say something to the tune of separate E and O insurance, separate D and O insurance. So error and omission, director and officer. Uh, besides, is so, so that should cover separate legal representation, but it might not. Uh, you can also put a, a, a retainer in place for legal, and then anything else comes out of your pocket. Th there's a few ways to handle that kind of thing. But by the way, I agree with you. If you are publicly traded or becoming a CISO of a publicly traded company, the the cost for having a CISO just went through the roof effectively because of the SEC, because of the Sullivan ruling, because of all these different things. And so yeah. you, you have to determine severance. You have to. So let's go over what Ben said really quickly. You have to determine not only your salary and that it's a good fit for you, which is always an important thing, but you have to determine your um, your severance package because becoming a CISO again after you leave your eighteen or eighteen month or two year lifespan there, it's not easy. There's not nearly as many as there used to be, and there's not nearly there's not many jobs open. Uh, ben Rothke just did a study. He said there's only about fifteen thousand. Cybersecurity jobs. This is not CISOs. This is all cybersecurity jobs out there in the country for right now. Uh, there's not 2.6 million or 3.2 million or whatever ridiculous number they're making up out of their. <clears throat> um, and so you can imagine that the CISO job pool is a tiny, tiny, tiny fragment of that. So you need to make sure you have a severance package, six to 12 months, as Ben said, and you need to have insurance. Error and omission, director and officer, you need to make sure you're covered under those. You have to be listed in them. Uh, and as well, separate legal representation, potentially an entire lawyer paid for for everything you do. What if everything you do has to go through your own lawyer or a lawyer who you are the client for? That costs a lot of money. Yeah, because, so having like, a CISO? Like a lot of people, even at, the, even at the C level, I think a lot of people fail to realize like um, HR and legal are not there to protect you either as a employee or as an officer, they're there to protect the company, right? And so the result of that means when the legal advice comes down that like we should we, we should pay this breach or we should um, not report on this, like that's all, that, that's not to protect you as an individual or the CEO necessarily as an individual, it's to protect the company. And so you need to make sure you have clear legal advice on what's in your best interest. Right. That, that yeah, can be different. Absolutely agreed. Yeah, I'm not saying it has to be in conflict, but it can be different. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And I think the, the legal aspects of this are, are definitely things that I think people have to understand that the, the, the game has changed between Sullivan's indictment and what's happening with Tim Brown right now from the solar wind side. The potential for personal litigation is real, which means if you don't have some of these things kind of negotiated in, you potentially have a big target on your back personally that I'm not sure most individuals would want to, to deal with. And so not only do you have to have the things that, that Ben and Josh kind of laid out, you know, you got to work with the legal of the company. You potentially have to work with your own legal environment just to protect yourself and your families. Like that's a big change that I don't think we realized a year ago at this time of what this was going to do, but it's pretty evident now that, that the personal potential liability as a CISO is real and you need to protect yourself against it. Gentlemen, yeah, I, mean, I am going to wrap this section. Right, sorry, oh, Matt, you're wrapping up. Quick comment. <laughs> sorry, yeah. you're wrapping up. No, I, I, I think we did a 
pretty good job with this. So I just yeah. want to thank everyone for watching and listening. We'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.